Hello. So today we're going to continue reading Maniac McGee. Um, we left off at chapter 26. So we're going to, um, at the end of chapter 25, actually. So we're going to start on chapter 26 today. So just a refresher of what happened in chapters 22 through 25, I believe. Um, so Jeffrey left Amanda's and he had been staying at the zoo in the buffalo enclosure where the buffaloes are it used to be the deer shed and then they moved the deer and the buffalo around um, in the month that jeffrey was staying with amanda or so um, and so he was sleeping in the lean-to near the buffalo for i don't know we don't know how long maybe a week um maybe a little more and he fell one day or he passed out because of he wasn't eating properly and wasn't taking care of himself. And Grayson, um, a man who works at the zoo, um, fixing things and cleaning things and um, general repair kind of stuff, um, found him and took him to like the locker room. It's um, the band shell, they call it. It's where they keep the equipment. Um, and no one's using that room right now because it's winter and or close to winter and um, the sports aren't being played. So he's sleeping there, Jeffrey's sleeping there and Grayson is taking care of him. He goes to work with Grayson most days and Grayson is feeding him um, plenty of food, things like Zeps, which are, we know now are hoagies or, or sandwiches, submarine sandwiches. Um, he feeds him butterscotch crimpets or egg McMuffins or it really um, they go out to eat and, and they, are getting to know each other and becoming friends with each other. Grayson um, doesn't stay in the band shell with uh, Maniac or Jeffrey. He stays at the Y. That's where he has a room that he rents um, and lives. And um, he's telling Jeffrey stories about his life. And we find out that Grayson was at one time a minor league baseball pitcher and he wanted really badly and tried really hard to make it to the major leagues. He did not succeed in that, however, um, but he did play minor league baseball for many, many years. Um, and then now he has a job at the zoo. Okay, so we're going to continue our reading from chapter 26. It was impossible to listen to such stories empty handed. As soon as Grayson started one, Maniac would reach into one of the equipment bags and pull out a ball or a bat or a catcher's mitt. Sniffing the scuffed horsehide aroma of the ball, rippling the fingertips over the red stitching. It's hard to say how these things can make the listening better, but they do. And for Maniac, they did. And of course, as happens with baseball, one thing led to another, and pretty soon the two of them were tossing a ball back and forth. And then they were outside where the throws could be longer, where you could play pepper on the outfield grass of the Legion field, the old man pitching, the kid tapping grounders, where you could shag fungos, the old man popping high flyers, the kid chasing them down. And now the stories were mixed with instruction. The grizzled rickety coot showing the kid how to spray liners to the opposite field, how to get a jump on a long fly even before the batter hits it, how to throw the curveball, stiff, crooked fingers that grappled cl clumsily with crimpet, crimpet wrap, wrappers curled naturally around the shape of the baseball. With the ball in his hand, the park handyman became a professor. As to the art of pitching, of course, the old man could show and tell, but he could no longer do, except for one pitch, the only one left in his repertoire from the old days. He called it the stop ball and it nearly drove Maniac Goofy. The old man claimed he discovered the stop ball one day in the Texas League and that he was long gone from baseball when he perfected it. Unlike most pitches, the stop ball involved no element of surprise. On the contrary, the old man would always announce it. Okay, he'd call in from the mound. Here she comes, now keep your eye on her because she's gonna float on up there and just about the time she's over the plate, she's gonna stop. Now nobody else ever hit it, so don't you go getting upset if you don't either. It's no shame to whiff on the stop ball. 
and then he'd throw it. Well, of course, Maniac knew that most, if not all of that was Blarney. And just to make sure, he watched the ball extra carefully. There sure didn't seem to be anything unusual about it, not at first anyway, but as the ball came closer, it did somehow seem to get more and more peculiar. And by the time it reached the plate, it might as well have stopped because Maniac never knew if he was swinging at the old man's pitch or at his speech. Whatever, in weeks of trying, he never hit out of the infield. It was October. The trees rimming the outfield were flaunting their colors. The kid and the geezers baseballed their lunch times away and the after dinner times and weekends. And every night as the old man left for his room at the Y, he would grouse, you ought to go to school. And one night the kid said back, I do. That's how the old man found out what the kid was doing with his mornings. He had noticed the books before, rows and row and piles of them that kept growing, but there being books, he didn't think much of it. Now the kid tells him, you know the money you give me? Each morning he gave the kid 50 cents or a dollar to get himself some crimpets. Well, I take it up to the library, right inside the door, they have these books they're selling, cases of them, old books they don't want anymore, and they only cost five or 10 cents a piece. He pointed to the piles. I buy them. He showed them to the old man, ancient, back broken math books, flaking travel books, warped spellers, mangled mysteries, biographies, music books, astronomy books, cookbooks. What's the matter, said the old man. Can't you make up your mind what kind you want? The kid laughed. I want them all. He threw his hands out. I'm learning everything. He opened one of the books. Look, geometry, triangles. Okay, isosceles tri triangles. These two legs, they look equal to you? The old man squinted. He nodded. Okay, but can you prove it? The old man studied the triangle for a full mi minute. If I had a ruler, maybe. No ruler, the old man sighed. Guess I give up. So the kid proved it, absolutely dead center proved it. Two days later, while playing Pepper in the Legion infield, the old man said to the kid, so why don't you go ahead and teach me how to read? Chapter 27. The story he told now was not about baseball, it was about parents who were drunk a lot and always leaving him on his own, about being put in classes where they just cut paper and played games all day, about a teacher who whispered to the principal just outside the classroom door, this bunch will never learn to read a stop sign. Right then and there, as if to make the teacher right, he stopped trying. The part I didn't tell about Bluefield, I was only 15. I ran away. The kid and the old man climbed into the pickup. They made three stops. First, they stopped by the park office at the zoo where Grayson told the superintendent he just wanted to work part-time for a while in the afternoons. Fine, said the superintendent, just so you don't expect to get paid full-time. Then they went to the library book sale racks and they bought about 20 old picture books, such as The Story of Babar and Mike Mulligan's Steam Shovel and The Little Engine That Could. They went to Woolworths for a small portable blackboard and a piece of chalk. Within three days, Grayson had the alphabet down pat. The shapes, the sounds. After a week, he could read 10 one-syllable words. But he was reading them from memory. It took another couple of weeks before he began to get the hang of sounding out words he had never seen before. The old man showed an early knack for consonants. Sometimes he got M and N mixed up, but the only one that gave him trouble day in and day out was C. It reminded him of a, of a bronc some cowboy dared him to ride in the Texas League days. He would saddle up that C, climb aboard, and grip the pommel for dear life, and old C, more often than not, it would just throw him. Whenever that happened, he'd just climb right back up and ride or some more. Pretty soon C saw who was boss and gave up the fight, but even at their orneriest, consonants were fun. Vowels were something else. 
He didn't like them and they didn't like him. There were only five of them, but they seemed to be everywhere. Why, you could go through 20 words without bumping into some of the shyer consonants, but it seemed as if you couldn't tiptoe past a syllable without waking up a vowel. Consonants, you knew pretty much where they stood, but you could never trust a vowel. To the old pitcher, they were just like his own best knuckleball come back to haunt him. In, out, up, down, not, event, the pitcher, much less the batter, knew which way it would break. Not even, I think that's supposed to be not even. I think that's a typo. Not even the pitcher, much less the batter, knew which way it would break. He kept swinging and missing. But the kid was a good manager and tough. He would never let him slink back to the showers, but kept sending him back up to the plate. The kid used different words, but in his ears, the old minor leaguer heard, Keep your eye on it. Hold your swing. Watch it all the way. Don't be anxious. Just make contact. And soon enough, that's what he was doing. Nailing those vowels on the button. Riding them from consonant to consonant, syllable to syllable, word to word. One day, the kid wrote on the blackboard, I see the ball. And the old man studied it a while and said, slowly, gingerly, I see the ball. Maniac whooped. You're reading. I'm reading, ripped the old man. His smile was so wide, he'd have to break it into sections to fit it through a doorway. Chapter 28. The first book Grayson read cover to cover was The Little Engine That Could. It took almost an hour and was the climax to a long evening of effort, and at the end, the old man was sweating and exhausted. The kid's reaction surprised him. He didn't jump up and yippee like he did after the first sentence. He stayed in the far corner, seated on a stuffed and lumpy equipment bag. He had kept his distance all during the reading, letting Grayson know there would be no cheating. He had to do it on his own. Now he was just staring at Grayson, a small smile covering his face. And now he was making a fist and clenching it toward Grayson. And he said, amen. What's that? Amen. What's that for? Who prayed? I learned it in the church I used to go to. You don't have to wait for a prayer. You say it when somebody does, says something or does something you really like. He hopped off the bag, thrust both hands to the ceiling, and shouted, Amen. And suddenly the kid was hugging him, squeezing with a power you never suspected was in that little body unless you had seen him pull a baseball almost to the trees in dense center field. Okay, said Maniac, clapping his hands. What'll it be? I'll be the cook, whatever you want. Maniac had a toaster oven now, compliments of his whiskered friend. In fact, little by little, Grayson had brought him a lot of things, a chest of drawers for his clothes, a space heater, a two-foot refrigerator, hundreds of paper dishes and plastic utensils, bla blankets, a mat to sleep on, which the kid ignored, preferring the chest protectors. In time, the place was homier than his own room at the Y. How about a corn muffin, said Grayson choosing something easy on his bad teeth and aching gums. Maniac went to the bookcase that served as a pantry. One corn muffin coming up. Toasted? Yeah, why not? Butter? Sure, butter. Something to drink with that, sir? Nah, muffin's enough. The apple juice is excellent, sir. It was great. It was a great year for apples. Live it up, thought Grayson. Yeah, okay, apple juice. Coming right up, sir. After the snack, the kid proved himself a good mind reader, as good a mind reader as a cook. Why don't you stay overnight, he said, it's late. While he groused about so pre pre preposterous of an idea, the kid laid down the mat he never used, bulldogged him down to it, pulled off his shoes and draped, draped, draped a blanket over him. He protested, this is supposed to be yours. The kid patted his chest protectors. I'm okay, I I'm okay. And he knew that was the truth of it. The old man gave himself up willingly to his exhaustion and drifted off like a lazy sky high fly ball. Something deep in his heart 
unmeasured by his own consciousness, soared unburdened for the first time in 37 years since the time he had so disgraced himself before the mud hen scout and named himself thereafter a failure. The blanket was there, but it was the boy's embrace that covered and warmed him. When somebody does something you really like, amen, the old man whispered into the cornmeal and baseball scented darkness. All right, that's all we're gonna read for now. Um, we will continue our reading after you go to the zoo. So have a good time at the zoo. And on our way back from the zoo, you can um, listen to a few more chapters. <laughs>